Hey, Off Color Fam, before we get started, I just want to remind you, MTOB, More Than One Box event is coming up on Saturday, August 18th. You can get tickets online. Just go to Eventbrite and search MTOB. You can check it out on the Off Color Pod Twitter. You can check it out on the Off Color Podcast Facebook or Tantigris.com. You are listening to Off Color, a podcast where we like to talk about race and some other stuff, and I hope you like it. (laughs) (laughs) This is Off Color. (laughs) Perfect, right? Actually, I'm really happy with that. All right, so... We're so excited tonight because, as usual, we have a fantastic guest. Because all of our guests are basically fantastic. That's true. Okay. Very fortunate. So that's a, but but I'm really excited because we have Sonia Gupta. <laughs> Wait, what? Why are we all clapping for Sonia? I'm gonna tell you why we're clapping for Sonia. Okay. Because Sonia is a lawyer turned software engineer, turned uh, mid-level anti-racism influencer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you crowned me with that, that last title there. <laughs> no, it's because, you know, that's how we met. So that, I don't know if you know this, why James, I don't. but Sonia and I met on Twitter because she tweeted something. I don't even remember what it was, but it was something about white supremacy, you know, whatever, and racism. And then all the things she was saying, and I was like, how do we not know each other? If you're in Denver and I'm in Denver, like, we are, like, you know, sisters from another mister or whatever. And so that's how we became friends. And then we actually then went on a lady date. Yes. Like, she came and met me, and we, like, went out for drinks, and and I was just, like, amazed by her and she's Likewise. so right back at you smart and beautiful and I'm just like so I really do feel really fortunate and blessed to have you here tonight so that's why I was clapping like that okay <laughs> you got it white James yeah I'm sorry I asked <laughs> <laughs> I feel very fortunate mm. to be here as well so All right. thank you for having me <sighs> well a lot has happened since our last episode we had um, Hashim Coates on. If you didn't listen to that episode, you need to because we talk a lot about some stuff that I don't really remember. But um, <laughs> don't worry about that. You we can talked just, a lot. That's we talked for sure. a lot. We did talk a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, and don't forget to vote. Okay. Now, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we had a deep. Anyway, you should listen to that. So people need to check that one out. However, since that time, Um, Since our last episode, and I don't, I think you saw um, from Twitter, I went on to my family reunion. Yeah. And which was in Savannah, Georgia. And if people don't know, maybe it's your first time listening to Off Color. Uh, I am half black and half white. And I identify as black when people like allow that, I guess. But I am, I am what I am. White James is, you guys, he's white. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in case you didn't know. So I was with my dad's side of the family, which is the black side. And, man, you should, I think you know about this from living in Denver, Sonia. It's a pretty uh, white place. I've actually yes. heard it called um, Wakanda for white people. Wow. That's <laughs> huh. Kind of. <laughs> so accurate. Isn't that just that America? Is accurate. <laughs> huh. Yeah, maybe. But I feel like here is... Denver's extra white. It is. It is. With a slice of white on the side. Yeah. You know what I mean? W- made with mayonnaise. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how white it is here. Yeah. Okay? White James knows all about it. Because, Absolutely. You know. You're part of the problem, White James. That's true. No. Many problems. He's part of the solution. Oh. <laughs> He's part of the solution. I meant that in the nicest way. Yeah. Okay. Plus, he lives in Aurora. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, my family reunion. Sorry, I got off track. Yeah. That never happens with me. Um, <laughs> but the thing that, okay, we have to take it back. Sorry. But Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia. But before I would say that, I want to say <laughs> that 
Maria Nagawa, who come, has been on our show a couple of times, she went to have her Ugandan wedding, her official ceremony. And so they went to do that, and she sent me a message, and she said, oh, it just feels so good to be here without all of the racism from the United States, like, weighing her down, because she's just in her home country, mm. black country. There are white people there and stuff, but they are not the majority. And... When she said that, I, I could really feel it. Like, I know it's been weighing on her since, since she's been in the States. And when I went to Savannah, to Georgia, and I was with my family, I felt had a very similar feeling from leaving Denver and being in a black space. Mm -hmm. And not just a black space, like my family who loves me. And it felt so good I can't I mean I don't I almost I like, can't even like I'll get like emotional about it but it was really it felt really good yeah. and we had a couple of funny moments and different things that happened because I'm always like talking about stuff and then we were at the Pinpoint Heritage Museum in it's like in Savannah if you get a chance to go that's amazing it's like the Gula culture and they learn all this stuff about like West African culture and Clarence Thomas was, was born there do you want to know what Clarence Thomas's nickname was mm. want to know yeah boy and it still is. They have a picture of him up there. It's so great. Anyway. Wait so, a minute. What? Is that a joke? What are you saying? Is boy. that a joke? His nickname yeah. was Boy? Yeah. That's like on a placard? Yes. Like I have a picture of it. I'll throw it up later. I have. I literally have a picture of it. It's Anyway, he was born there. That's where he grew up. He was part of the, the culture. I'm with Clarence Thomas over here. It's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting thing. But anyway, it was just funny. We're in the gift shop, and, and then I picked up this book, and I was like, oh, this looks cool. It's like African-American stories or something. And then I turned over the bag, and the lady was white. And then I turned oh, to no. one of my aunties, and I was like, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I can buy this. Look who wrote it. This might be racist. And she was like, slow down, sister soldier. <laughs> It just made me like <laughs> laugh so hard, but I felt so wonderful and accepted and comfortable. And that is not a way I have ever felt in Denver. Um, except in, I will say this, like when I go to that poetry night at the Casbah, like I love going there. Then Theo Wilson episode. <laughs> Who, Who knows? knows? In the past, just Google it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but that's a space I love to go to because it is a black space. And after I came back from the family reunion, that was like the first thing I did was I went to that poetry night over the weekend just to be, you know, to be there. And, you know, my poetry's not that good. And uh, somebody recorded me and it is on Twitter. And I am a crazy person, you guys. <laughs> So you should check that out. <laughs> it's your artistic brilliance. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm just like cursing at people, telling them they're racist. Okay, they so speaking it. of racism, Sonia, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you might know a little something, something about that. Um, as I mentioned that we had met before on Twitter, it's because you're a very outspoken person on Twitter. Um, and I love that about you. I think it's amazing. And, but I feel like something happened this week. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to talk about it with you. And I wanted to hear, I guess I just wanted to hear more about it. Because, like, I see your tweets. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like, you need to follow Sonia Gupta on Twitter. Everybody should do that. Let's get her from mid-level to. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's just at Sonia Gupta? At Sonia Gupta 504. That's the New Orleans, New Orleans area code. New Orleans. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You're from New Orleans. Yeah, I can give you some backstory on, on why I am the way that I am and why I speak up in the way that I do if you would be interested. I would love yeah. to hear that. All right. Um, so I grew up in a really small town in southern Louisiana, a town that I'm about to go back to on Friday, and I'm really nervous. So when you talked about your family reunion being like a safe place, when I go back to Louisiana, I feel poisoned. Like it is not comfortable for me to be back there. I love my parents and they still live there. Um, and that's why I'm going is to see them. But I am just as fine to never leave the house when I visit because I don't want to go out into the world of Trump country and this place, this super racist backwoods place full of ignorance that I grew up in for all my life as a kid and spent some of my adulthood there too. So yeah, that's like where I'm at. But I grew up, I guess I've started to think of it as in between blackness and whiteness. Mm. Um, so the town I grew up in, there were uh, three Indian families, all immigrants. So I'm a first generation immigrant. I'm a child of, of immigrant parents. Um, 
who moved here uh, from actually from New York, which is kind of like where everybody starts. Mm. <laughs> and then they kind of spread out across the country. So there were, there were two other Indian families and then it was just black and white in the South. Right. Mm-hmm. And with all of the dynamics that that entails um, and all of the racism and all of the oppression and all of the poverty and all of the class issues that you see in a small, poor town. So that was the environment I grew up in, but I was very much like shuttled off. And I think a lot of children of Indian immigrants are shuttled off into like, go towards whiteness, Mm -hmm. right? If you're going to pick something, identify with whiteness. Um, And so I did. I was sent to, uh, when I was younger, I went to a more diverse school. But uh, after my parents started to find more, more success in their businesses, they sent me off to an almost all white school. Um, and for many years, I was the only person of color in my class. So that was the environment I grew up in. And I was not white. I wasn't black. I didn't know what I was. I actually for a long time didn't know that I wasn't white. I didn't mm. know that I was brown. I didn't know mm. there was like, I didn't know that it was related to my skin. Uh, I just knew that there was something wrong with me. That was what I internalized for most of my childhood. Um, and even my adulthood, I still, you know, kind of cope with it. So that was the kind of backdrop um, of my childhood. And then I became, I went to law school um, and Wh- became. Which law school did you go I to? I went to Loyola in New Orleans. So mm, yeah. I went to NYU much. for undergrad. So I escaped oh, for a while. Um, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that was like an eye opening experience yeah. to be in a city where nobody cares what I am, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just a number. That was amazing. That was eye opening and brilliant. Um, but I ended up deciding to go back home towards uh, Louisiana and moved back to uh, New Orleans to go to law school. Uh, So New Orleans is about 200 miles uh, east of where I grew up. So I went to law school there, and then after law school, I practiced as a public defender um, shortly after Katrina in Mm. New Orleans. And then um, after that, I became a prosecutor um, closer to where my parents lived. So I spent most of my legal career in the criminal justice system in southern Louisiana. So Mm. I saw a lot um, that I think your average human being never sees. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the experience of sitting in a criminal courtroom in Orleans Parish um, is like seared in my mind. Uh, and the experience of watching how white supremacy functions in, a, in, a, in the criminal justice system is not something I'll ever forget. It's just like become part of my DNA at this point. So I think these were all things I had internalized and never really understood where I fit into that because I also played a role in that. And being not black and not white, being a model minority, and I I put that on quotation marks because it's a myth, um, that was also a role that I played. So I think a lot of people in this country are having a moment of reckoning right now about who we are as a nation and what we believe in and where we stand on issues of race. And so I, I think I'm part of that kind of um, revolution, actually. And that has been the thing that's compelled me to speak up, because I think we don't really have a choice not to at this point, especially. It's just very urgent right now. So given my background, which is very unique, I don't know anybody with that particularly, you know, that set of circumstances, which has informed my views on race. Um, that's why I speak up. And I found that my Um, my experience resonates with a lot of people. So a lot of what I talk about is not, I'm not a scholar of race, right? There are scholars of race. Dr. Diggs was ours. Yeah, right. Um, And I would never pretend to be. I speak largely from my experience and my just observations um, as an outsider who looked in on race, but also was part of that system as well. So that's been kind of what brought me to Twitter. And I found that it was a really good platform for, for speaking up. And you had kind of a big... Uh, attack on there, I guess you could say. Yeah, th- I've had several episodes of serious harassment where I've either had to lock my account or like go away for a little while. The last one um, was precipitated by uh, it's kind of a circuitous chain of events. Um, I, I tweeted something about women in tech, um, which resonated with a lot of women in tech, and it was about feminism. Um, and so that brought on a lot of white women followers. Which I kind of was like, oh, yeah, Rebecca, you're laughing because you know, right? You know, <laughs> they came, yeah, they came so, for the cake. I know but they get served. You know, know what I mean? Yeah. So, so when that happened, I was like, oh shit, I should probably warn them. You know, it's this is like due that. diligence, right? I so I tweeted. I said, you know, I got a bunch of white women followers, but you should also know I mostly tweet about race issues of race, and I tweet about how um, dangerous and toxic white women are to people to women of color. 
And I, I cited uh, Ruby um, Hamid, who is a really brilliant journalist. Uh, she wrote this article in The Guardian about white women's tears and particularly mm-hmm. how they are used against women of mm-hmm. color um, in the workplace. Mm-hmm. So, oh, no. And in life in general, really. Yeah. So, yeah, I linked to that, and it was just one tweet. And that exploded. And I don't know why or how that happened. I think my profile had just been kind of, like, picking up steam a bit. So, of course, it brought the attention of neo-Nazis and white supremacists who then... Ah, man, I got pictures. Someone sent me like a picture of an aborted fetus. Some six people got together and threaded the N word um, and sent that to me. Uh, And just any variety of go back to India. They called me shit skin. They called me ugly. Like it's, it's almost like it's just like a litany of things that people say. And the resounding theme through all of that is you're not American. Go Mm -hmm. back. And th- th- that, I mean, what's silly is that I am very much American. I was born in New York and raised you know, in Louisiana. I, you know? One of the things that kind of stood out to me from some of that is then you, someone was like, go back, go back to your home country. And you're like, I'm already here, motherfucker. Yeah. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. No, it's that, true. That's exactly <laughs> that's like, what I was thinking. You're like, I'm already here. What are you talking about? And I mean, as someone who is uh, somewhat racially ambiguous, people are are always questioning where I'm from and yeah. what my nationality is, yeah. you know, and, and that, that kind of thing. So I feel you on that. Um, but I guess I'm just wondering, like, do you feel like you shouldn't speak out so much? No, not at all. So, so the way that I've figured out to deal with that kind of harassment is just how I deal with it. I don't know if other people find it useful, some people say don't engage the trolls, but what I've realized is these aren't trolls, right? People Trolls are, like, generally harmless, and they actually know that they're just trying to, like, get at you. These are actually, like, abusive people, yeah. and that's what I call them. I call them abusers and harassers. I don't call them yeah. trolls. These are actually malevolent, mean, awful people that yeah. are not just looking to get a rise. They're actually looking to hurt you, and they actually believe the things that they're talking about. And they're huge cadres of these people, and they'll end up, like, tagging each other and quote tweeting you and bringing you to the yeah. attention of other white supremacists. Yes. And so what happened, um, not this past Monday, but the, the Monday before, uh, was that I had to lock my account because they were just coming in so quickly. Um, I couldn't block and report them fast enough on Twitter. So I was just kind of threw my hands up and said, I got to lock. I, I tweeted, I was like, even I have a limit to the amount of abuse that I can take. Uh, and I know like it doesn't affect me internally as a person as much as I think it would have when I was younger, but I'm still human, right? And, and there comes a point where like I just Twitter becomes unusable for me at that point. Um, it's just nothing but harassment in my mentions. Yeah. So you know that that's when I I locked down. Um, and in response, and what's crazy is that is that I was just tweeting about white women and how white women are toxic to women of color. And that brought on a bunch of white men supremacists. And so the next day, obviously, like, I don't shut up. So I unlocked later that day. Um, And so on Tuesday, I think it was, I posted a a thread um, about why, my theories about why that particular tweet had attracted the attention of so many white supremacists. And the basic premise being, you know, how white women are viewed in our culture Mm -hmm. um, as as both... Most precious. Yes. We must protect the white. Exactly. Sorry. Um, Yeah, it's true. And, and, and they're, they're both revered and denigrated, right? And I went mm. to some of this, this detail in, in that thread. And that thread then brought more white supremacists to, to my, <laughs> to my doorstep, right? But at that point, I kind of was like, I'm not locking down again. Fuck them. I'm, I'm not yeah. letting them, them win. Um, and so I just, I realized now looking back, like most of last week was me like block, like most of my time was spent like blocking and reporting and writing. And, and, and the way that I cope with it is to quote tweet um, a lot of the most offensive ones so that I can show my followers what's happening. Because I think what a lot of people don't see, they don't see that level of harassment. They don't see what's being said. Right. So it's useful for me is to share with my large audience. Of very, I have a lot of white followers yeah. um, and a lot of followers in tech. Um, and I want to show you what I'm dealing with. And then it's usually, I'm usually mocking them. I call it mock and block. So yeah. <laughs> I mock them, I make fun of them. It's my way of coping, but it's also I get to show what's happening. And yeah. then I just block them because I, I can't continue to engage. That's interesting. This is a little bit off topic on that, but I often, because I see that mock and block a lot, and as someone who's like trying to like promote my anti-racism, my multicultural shit, you know, whatever, the stuff I'm trying to promote, I sometimes feel like frustrated that I'm like, why do people give so much attention mm-hmm. to these like 
terrible people and then they like retweet them and I'm like when you could like retweet about my film or my podcast mm-hmm. or you know like yeah. like shout out to Boots Riley mm-hmm. like elevating people and stuff you know mm-hmm. like I love that and like someone made a joke they were like my whole timeline is just Boots Riley retweeting <laughs> every every tweet about sorry to bother you but I have to say that for me if Honestly, like, I felt really good. I, I felt seen by him and his work. Like, and anyway, that's a whole other thing. But I'm just saying, like, now, but I can see when you're saying that, mm-hmm. like, oh, this is why I do it. That that kind of helps me to understand. Because, mm-hmm. like, I follow um, Hari Kondabolu, mm-hmm. and I, like, love him. Yeah, he's great. Like, I deeply love him. I have a small crush on Hari, so if you're listening. Hari. Just saying. Hari. <laughs> Okay, so he's the homie. He's he's yeah. he's fantastic, I think. But I do sometimes feel like, you know, like he retweets that stuff and I'm like, mm. why are you retweeting this like white supremacist, you know? But it's it's educational for me as a woman. It's also protection. Uh, so I have been written like Breitbart wrote an article about me last year in response to I spoke up about a conference in Boulder that has hosted a white supremacist and um, a red pillar men's rights activist as speakers. Um, and I attended when the men's rights activist was speaking and found out about his activities. And, and basically he said things like women are only good for pregnancy. Um, he, just, he was awful. Mm. So I, I spoke up about that on Twitter, which is kind of when this whole process started for me was last year um, yeah. around May, May, end of May. Um, and so I, Breitbart wrote an article about me that brought a lot of awful stuff to my doorstep. People were threatening my family. I got um, a white supremacist approach me at a wine party in Boulder and was like, I know who you are. I'm an American nationalist. I know this sounds absurd, but that is exactly what he said. I'm an American nationalist. He said, you're on 4chan. You need to watch your back, um, like threatening me or indicating that like somehow I'm under, like people are talking about me. I think what I've realized that the problem with Twitter is that it has largely, it's a tragedy of the commons situation, is this idea that we will let the populace kind of like regulate itself, and that is very broken. And what that's resulted in is that some people, for example, Kim Creighton, do you know Kim Creighton? She's my friend. Um, She is very outspoken. Uh, She's a black woman who is very Mm -hmm. outspoken about inclusion and diversity in tech. Someone reported her for saying, talking, like she used the phrase, like, go into, go play in traffic, which is like harmless phrase. Someone reported that for encouraging violence or encouraging self-harm, I guess. And she got suspended for like several hours on Twitter because of that. Meanwhile, I reported someone who this last week um, said, uh, you know, what did he say? He said, you know, I'm, I don't want to protect you. You're not white. Um, hopefully you'll be like taken care of. And then he uses this hashtag called day of the rope, which is a hashtag, which references hanging, lynching people. Um, so he's threatening me with like the possibility of being hung. Mm -hmm. I report that to Twitter and they're like, no violation. And he's fine. So I tweeted about the fact that I reported that to Twitter. Um, I screenshotted the email that I got saying no violation was found numerous people, mostly white men, then reported that tweet and then the account got suspended. So that's kind of Mm -hmm. frustrating, right? You know, to know that like, apparently what I say doesn't really matter what I'm going through. And so that's where I think the policing problem happens to to speak to kind of what you were talking about with the Omari Hardwick account. But I don't think that that's a, I think saying that it's the the tragedy of the commons that they're letting people police themselves, I think that's I, that's more charitable of a reading than I would give. The the, the situation <laughs> that you just described <clears throat> is Twitter proactively yeah. favoring oh, yeah. white supremacy over other points of view. I, I'm starting to come to that. Conclusion I mean, that's now. what yeah. it's. I mean, and the mm-hmm. Twitter, like most of the tech world, I'm yeah. sure I don't have to tell you, is run by like a certain strain of like nihilistic white dude oh, yeah. who's I've like super on... toxic. Yeah, I've received a lot of their abuse. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, those guys on 4chan, mm-hmm. we joke that they live in their mom's basement, and a lot of them do. A lot of them make $150,000 a year in tech. Yep. And, a lot of, and that's why this whole like don't feed the trolls, that's some like 90s shit. Like, the internet is the real world now. Yes. And like, we need to get over this idea that what's happening on there isn't real. Yeah. Because it is. Absolutely. It has very real world implications. It did for me. Yeah. yeah. I felt upset when you were talking about about the things people are saying to you. And everybody knows Rebecca likes to talk about herself and her own experiences. And I was thinking about when I had my little beef with Michael Rappaport, which we always talk about. God, but, Michael Rappaport is such an awful person. Yeah, but you know, he had that that we have a we talk about it because it's like it's my only celebrity beef. But 
it was more though it was scary because he was sending me like messages like through his like dummy son's account or whoever saying they were going to like come to Denver and shut down my podcast. Right. And so like I reported them. I I went to the, my husband is like, he's pretty paranoid, but he was like, you have to tell the police. So I called the freaking FBI because my husband is like kept in safety and I sometimes do what he says, but usually I don't. But in this case I was like, okay. So I called and they were like, okay, you need, you should report it to your local police. So I did. And they were kind of just like, nope, sorry, nothing. It's too vague or, you know, but like, I knew that no one was coming to hurt me, but a little part of me, but what happened was then because of that tweet, all of his like right. douchey yeah. followers, like, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm just like this librarian nerd, right, on Twitter that nobody cares about. And then this motherfucker is like retweeting me purposefully so that people will come for me. Yep, yeah. that's what they do. And and then Twitter didn't think anything was wrong with that. Yep. They even say it when you report. They're, when they when they reply and say they found no violation, they're like, well, you know, targeted harassment could be like retweeting someone or like quote tweeting someone or yeah. specifically mentioning them, right? That's all it would take. But so often they don't find that to actually be abuse. So, and then I, it was funny because when I, when, when uh, we were talking about having you on as a guest, White James was like, oh, I just deleted my Twitter account. And I'm like, what? Because yep. you're like one of the only people that likes my tweets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the two people who like my tweets are at this table. <laughs> They're at this table. And Boots Riley once in a while. Hey, Boots. Sorry. Why did you, uh, no, whatever. You can still, t- you can like me from the off color one maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, follow us on Twitter, Off Color Pod. Um, anyway, I do most of the tweeting from that. That's why it's just, her description says tweets may, tweets may vary. <laughs> does it say that? I didn't even know. It does. <laughs> That's funny. We are like the worst. Tw- this show, this show would be world famous if we were better at social media. Maybe, maybe, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the thing we need. <laughs> that, yeah, okay. Oh. Anyways, I was distracted by that because really though, why did you? Oh, it was a sort of, it was not a, I mean, first of all, I am a terrible Twitterer. I had like probably less than 50 followers. Nobody uh, gave a shit about anything. I I know, but didn't you have a tweet that went viral one time? Oh, I did. This was years ago. <laughs> yes, I had a tweet that went viral several years ago. It's what not even worth tweet? talking about. No, it is hey, totally worth talking about. Do you about. remember when CeeLo Green covered Imagine by John Lennon and everyone got super mad because yeah. he changed the lyrics so that they wouldn't be atheist anymore? And I just made a tweet to my literally 12 followers <laughs> at that time that Imagine is a boring, schmaltzy-ass <laughs> song and who gives a shit what anybody does to it. And um, I was Apparently like, you had like one follower out of yeah. those 12 that was like a big deal. Well, I think what happened was someone on Yahoo News just did a search for... <laughs> CeeLo Green Imagine just to see what hot takes would come up. Yeah. And he saw mine. I literally don't think my tweet had a like. And it got quoted in this article. And now, so this is, of course, this is a pale in many ways comparison to Sonya's story. But it does show how weird people on the fucking internet are. I got put up on Yahoo and it was like, uh, some people were offended, blah, blah, blah. Some people didn't care. User, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't even under my real name. I think I just had like my initials up there or something. And it was like, because again, I'm a 90s kid and I don't even like putting my real name on anything. But so like, um, they quoted whatever I said. And the next morning I woke up and I had like 200 replies. And it was was all people like... um, uh, cause people like that song. Uh, I don't know if that. and, um, uh, there were like 200 replies that were like, Oh, I bet you're happy. Now you got your 15 minutes of fame out of this. <laughs> and they were like, doing all, like, all that. Those so sweet Twitter mad. points. Yeah. Oh, and they geez. were just like, yeah, just really like railing against it. And just basically like saying like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I'm a piece of shit nobody who will never accomplish what John oh. Lennon did, which is true. That's fine. John Lennon, that's, that's fine. But it's like, but I made no effort to like put that in the universe. Like I thought 12 people were going to read that tweet and like, 
it was just a gag for me and my like music nerd friends about how oh doesn't this song suck like I just thought it was funny oh my god but yeah but that is neither here nor there so <laughs> the reason I deleted my account this morning was just because I saw the thing from Jack uh, I don't even know his last name Jack from Dorsey. Twitter Jack Dorsey um, about how he's not going to ban Alex Jones or Infowars um, basically because they haven't violated his rules, etc. And I'm not personally very invested in whether Infowars gets banned from anything. Um, but it was just after seeing that and seeing the thing where a woman did get banned for saying go play in traffic to a white supremacist, mm -hmm. I just felt like what I said before, which is like, this is a website whose top-down culture thinks that um, white supremacy and rape threats are like, okay, and yeah. that completely passive bullshit, non-threatening stuff from other users is not. And it's just a gross, toxic place, and I don't want to hang out there. And that was kind of just how I felt. So I guess tweets won't vary. They're all going to be from me, from off color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, but we were, we were talking about this a little bit before, off mic, but... Sonia and I about like it's like it's like we're on the fence like because I feel the same like when you said that I'm not gonna lie White James I was like damn he right but then I was like but I love Twitter how else can I get fake celebrities to follow me you know so it's like <laughs> yeah something I've noticed is that Twitter has very different meanings for different demographics mm. so for white people it's largely just Twitter but for women of color, it is the way we connect with each other. So yeah. that's how I met you. That's how I met Syrah um, indirectly. That's how I met my friend Kim. Um, that is how I've met. That is how I've built community. Yeah. Um, and that's also been how I've been able to find my voice mm. and be active and be an advocate. Um, because, and I, you know, this is kind of special. The Washington Post quoted me on Friday. Um, oh, shit. Uh oh! In reference, you to going, all of you this going stuff. way up, girl. Mid level, you going up to kinda, the top. Kind of. She had to bring that out. I, <laughs> I brought up my Yahoo News credit. I do it. <laughs> but, but you know what I said there was that these people, meaning the white supremacists, are terrified that we have an equal voice on this platform. Mm. That we, women of color, people of color in general, now have a place to share our views and make them public to the world. And these assholes don't want that. And so they're just enraged by it. They just, they can't believe it. And so what they do is they attack and they attempt to silence. So like what's the effect has been on me over the last week is like, I'm kind of taking it a little, a little slow. Like the last couple of days have just been like puppy tweets. That's my other thing. I love yeah. to tweet about puppies and dogs, but, but like more benign things and just kind of retweeting people and sharing kind of, you know, the fact that I'm on this podcast or whatever show and not doing these like thought out kind of intense parts of me writing these threads that are my observations about issues of race. Cause I know that right now my profile is hot for lack of a better term and, and it's just going to bring more grief. So I need to take a minute, you know, to kind of just not do that for a bit. <laughs> minority in this room yeah it feels good he always is because we don't have white people yeah. on here oh, so far cool. so far we have that's not. true we've never had a white guest huh? we don't need white guests no, i'm half white and you're white you're right you don't need no white guests except maybe i was thinking of one white guest i would like to have i'll tell you about who it is later oh, yeah? yeah but i think that we might be good i, I do remember sometimes think in the early stages yeah we only had one or two episodes up and you proposed bringing on a Trump person. I oh did. God, no, no. You know, it seemed it's, I, I was, I didn't like it and Greg was deeply against it. So we didn't do it. But, um, at that time it didn't seem as ah, yeah. toxic. They were kind of like a strange anomaly yeah. for a while. Right. It was like, what the hell just happened? Maybe this is funny. Yeah. And then it got bad fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. It didn't so, seem like an outrageous proposition at the yeah. time. 
Yeah. Well, now, no. And I mean, so... Well, now you have Jack Dorsey going on freaking Sean Hannity's show, right? Like, he doesn't do media interviews. Very, very rarely. But he fucking goes on Hannity to talk about what's happening with Twitter. Like, th- 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 that's why I'm saying I'm not I know. Oh, no. I'm doing the calculus. I know. I, and it's like I, the answer is I'm they starting, like that yep, side. I'm starting to come around to exactly what you're thinking. And that's like, uh, I'm having a crisis thinking about that because Twitter's been really powerful for me in terms of like my own personal growth and learning the voice. So I've learned so much about like the experiences of trans women, which I'd never really understood yeah. before. I'm learning about the experiences of people with disabilities, which yeah. I would have never heard about yeah. before. I'm learning about the experiences of, of, of black women that I had observed from afar, but never, you get intimate on Twitter, right? Yeah. You get intimate observations about people's lives. And I have learned so much about humanity in the last couple of years that I, I've only been on Twitter for like two years, really. And I am so sad to know that, like, that might be a thing I would have to let go of. Yeah. And I just say that you're like, I've been on Twitter for two years, and you have, like, a gajillion followers. And I've been on Twitter since it started in 2006. (laughs) And I have, like... (laughs) I'm sorry, I just think that's funny. Damn, you're better than me. That's cool. No, I think um, it's a confluence of events, right? It's circumstance. Mm. So what I probably would still be, like fairly unknown if what had happened with Lambda Conf hadn't happened yeah. with that with that speaker and then the Breitbart article and then I was very public and then I got actually got to know people who work at Twitter and I have friends who work at Twitter I now. Do. And we, yeah we talk about these things, right? And and um and then that kind of emboldened me, right? I hate like the term emboldened is often used to describe white supremacists who feel emboldened now. But yeah. like I fucking feel emboldened too, right? Yeah. Like fuck I do them, too. I do right? too. I, like, what do we have to lose at the end of the day? Nothing. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm also like, there's a deep sense of urgency here. Like things are escalating, right? White, white supremacy has been around for hundreds of years, but now we're in like an accelerating cycle. Yes. And that's incredibly dangerous. And I see that and I feel it. And I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I, what am I doing with my life? Oh yes, this is what's happening in our world. I am on the right path, right? And so that kind of like, kind of gave me fire. I think it gave me some sort of like uh, motivation to continue saying these things and it just escalated from there, right? That became a thing that I am known for, but also that's just who I am. Like I wake up in the morning and I think about this shit and I go to bed and I think about this shit and I'm every day, like I probably can't have a relationship with a man because all I'd ever want to talk about would be race. Like maybe that gets boring. Is that romantic? Well, that's all I talk. Well, here's the thing because I say this and I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll say it a million times, but because of, because I mix race (sighs) and particularly because I'm black and white also, but I feel like race is something I think about all the time, every day. I'm never not thinking about Mm -hmm. it. It's just part of my life. I'm married to a mixed race person. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. So that is something that we talk about all the time. It's not, it's just, and it's not unromantic. Mm -hmm. We'd be doing it. We got the baby to prove it. There's intimacy though in having that, right? Shared (laughs) No, but that's my, well, that was, oh Jesus. Everything's fine here, people. (laughs) (laughs) We almost lost a beverage. Mine is okay. Um, But that was one of the reasons that I I married my husband. White presenting as he is, he's not white. And he understands my feelings and he knows what's going on, right? And you can learn more about my beautiful husband on another episode. (laughs) Just go Uh, look for it. Coachella but whiter. (laughs) Coachella but whiter. I don't remember the episode number. (laughs) It was a good one. I though. like that we're starting to have too many episodes to remember yeah. when things happen. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, okay. So I guess the question is like, to Twitter or not to Twitter? And I know I'm not leaving Twitter right now, for sure, right? But it is something to think about. Like, And then again, I, I it occurs to me that that way James is like, mm, I'm just going to delete my account. But for us, yeah. it's the only way lifeline. that we're able to even get our voices heard. I've gotten you know? jobs from Twitter. I've gotten, I've made connections. That's like my, I have family. On, like I would lose people that I DM on a daily basis. That's where my family Well, is. that's why I said it was no, I literally did it. I was still in bed. Hmm. I was like, so lazy. I just woke up and was like, <laughs> white people so lazy. swiping through and was just like, <laughs> eh, fuck it. This guy's an asshole. And then I just like delete. It wasn't a, it was not a weighty decision in my life in any kind yeah. of way. Yeah. But also it's not a, it's not a, um, I don't talk about that or say what I, what I say about Twitter to be like, oh, you should get off it. I mean, it's, if you have to like, 
if you had to opt out of everything in society that was run by white supremacists, Jeez. you know, where would you be? I feel like we'd be in Wakanda yes. forever. But I also feel like I, that's kind of, okay, so if I may, I want to talk about something in my personal life. Yeah. Okay. Nothing I say reflects the opinions of my employer. Um, these are all my own personal opinions. So I'm at. Okay, so I saw that Sorry to Bother You movie. We talked a little bit about it on our last episode, but that movie has been having like an effect on me continuously. Like I'm ready to like organize a labor union right now. Like I'm going crazy from it. Okay, and we can't keep going like this. Like, with, like, the status quo. So, like, I think, yeah, like, we're using Twitter. It's our jam. Yada, 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 right? We're doing that. But I don't want it to be... I want some new shit. I want our shit. And I feel like, how can we get something new? Because everything's already, like, established. It's, like, the same thing in politics. Like, how do we get a new radical person, you know? Because, like, um... uh, What's her name? Syra? Ocasio. Uh, oh, uh, Cortez. Cortez. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. She grew up like right where I grew up in Westchester County. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that they make it seem like she was just this girl, this waitress that suddenly decided to get into politics. She's like, went to Brown. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like she's, she's cool. She knows what's up and I'm excited and I'm, I want anything that's going to like get people talking about it and get people excited although it makes me sad because I think you've said this it's like now politics has to be like this like celebrity show like we have to be like entertained instead of people being like public servants and like working for their constituents and I will say this James Rashad Coleman is a true I can't say fuck can I sorry he's like a man of faith and stuff but like he to me he is like exemplifies what it means to be like a public servant Mm -hmm. and trying to serve his community and he has his heart like in the right place and I and I'm scared for him because I feel like he's not going to be able to make it because he's actually good and like cares about his community and his people and I just I just hate that that's, like, what politics has, has become now, that it, ha- it does have to be, like, sexy and, like, exciting or something or disgusting, yeah. racist. Well, you, you bring up this interesting point about, <clears throat> like, creating something different, right? And this is something I talked to with uh, a friend of mine. Um, his name is Sean Valentine, and he's the director of operations for the Hidden Genius Project out of Oakland. And what they do is they train um, young black men for careers in tech, mm. um, and teach them to be developers. So we talked about this and, you know, he, we were sort of like after, after his students graduate, do we want them to be in this current pipeline? Like, do I want them in this tech industry? Do we want them? Do we, do we want people of color? Do people of color, are they best served by being in this tech industry? And my answer is actually no. Like the, the way that the tech industry is right now, it is not built I feel like every industry is like that, though. Like, I'm a librarian, Mm -hmm. and nothing I say reflects my employer. But we don't have a a lot of black librarians. Mm. Right? Yeah. 26 branches. 26 branches and a main library. And there are six black librarians, something like that. So, so it's not just that. And like, that was something that we talk about and I don't want to like talk too much about my employer because I can't, because I, that's not good, but I have free speech and all of the industries I feel like are like that. Like, where do you want to go? Where can you go as a person of color in the United States and thrive and have a positive like work experience? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess Where? That, what I was going to segue into is related to what you're talking about. Uh, this idea that, like, the current pipeline is not the pipeline that we want. We need to build a new pipeline to a totally different place, right? But again, so here it is. Boots! Boots is in my brain! I feel like any pipeline is still making us, like, working for the capitalist money machine. And I'm like... I don't know. I'm so, like so, freaking out. So how out. do you then how do you then solve that? Right? You get you have to get to the So this is what I realized when I was a public defender and a prosecutor. I was in a part of a system where white supremacy had been so abusive to black Americans and this was the last stop really, right? I was in a part of a system yeah. that was trying to put a band-aid on a massive fucking problem and I realized there's no hope there. 
So the, what's the underlying systemic issue, right? It's that it's, it's systemic racism. It's what like white people want to just say like, oh, I'm going to pull up the dictionary definition of racism. No, that needs to be scrapped. In fact, everybody listening to this, like don't look at the dictionary to decide what racism is because yeah. it's not, it doesn't mean anything. Understand systemic racism. It has to do with like power dynamics and, and, um, and sort of like historical oppression, which doesn't get factored into the dictionary definition. But that said, it's like that that's the underlying thing, right? That's why I spend so much time talking about race because that's the number one problem plaguing this country. So you could fix all the pipelines. You could try to, you know, build this new pipeline. You could try to build an industry off on the side. Um, but you still haven't addressed that underlying issue, yeah. um, which is the thing that's very broken in this country. And it's getting broken more and more by the day. So I think that's one of the reasons that I like you so much and I was so like attracted to you and your ideologies and the things you talk about because for me, that's what I say. And I had a conversation when I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Oh, I remember. I saw you tweeted about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you did? You looked, was I tweeting my celebrity you, friends? You looked hey, Ava. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But somebody said that to me because I'm, I'm working on a screenplay right now. And that is part of it is this idea of like race is like the thing that causes like the apocalypse, right? And that's copyrighted, motherfucker. So don't be out there trying to steal my ideas. Um, did you take a note on that, White James? I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that in. <laughs> so. But, and the guy said to me, he's like, no, I don't think it's that simple. And I was like, that's what white people always want to say. They always want to talk about class. And this is a fight I got into with like H-Soul on here. This is some shit I don't like because I feel like it's like trying to give some kind of pass. And I, as the person, as a product of the most forbidden love in America. Yeah. Okay. The things I've seen and experienced and know from my lived experience I'm just like, this is it. This is the thing. And then when I break it down even more to me, it comes down to white supremacy. Yep. And it comes down to this idea that somehow white people are inherently superior and how people, you know, this idea of like changing race over time, like the Irish who weren't always white, you know, and they trot that out. Now, and I don't want to like belittle people's like cultural experiences or histories or any of that stuff because like I'm pretty sure it was fucked up to be an Irish person <laughs> you know what I'm saying like a hundred years ago or whatever right it's no good same thing like when you know Jewish people when I bring up the holocaust for some reason when you're trying to talk about slavery you know or whatever and oh, I'm off on a fucking tangent Pull so, me in. Pull, bring no, me no, in, White James. I that's wanna, your job. No, I want to ask you about, so where does that slot in? Because that's where I, I mean, it's it's an oversimplification to say that there's a big argument between like liberals and leftists or whatever. I think that that's too reductive. But a lot of that is the conversation. There's people who are, um, you know, really into uh socialism or communism or Bernie or whatever, whose take is like, man, if we just fix this fucked up capitalist machine, everything like falls into place. Yeah. Um, but it won't, right? But it won't because every communist country ever has been racist as fuck. So that's nonsense, first of all. But like, also, it's just not, I agree with what you're saying. The true north of American society is white supremacy. And that's in everything. So I don't, I struggle with it. I struggle with it too, because there is part of me, I hate this machine that we live in. And I think it's ugly and dehumanizing to everybody who's in it. And it's dehumanizing to some people more than others. But I don't see how fixing the economy fixes white supremacy. It doesn't. I, I, so I think white supremacy, when we use that term, people get scared. It needs oh, to be a thing yeah. that we just internalize as an every day. That white supremacy is in me and you and you, all three of us. We have like internalized it to mm -hmm. some degree because we live in white supremacy. We've been indoctrinated into it. But also, I think we're the three of us are probably like more 
more likely to admit that and accept that than your average white woman who claims she's liberal and wears a pink pussy hat and has decided that she's liberal and progressive and is therefore not racist. So the minute I bring up the idea that her behavior is perpetuating white supremacy, she shuts down and becomes violent or becomes angry or wants to retaliate. And this is the same thing with liberal white America, right? It's like, this is the modern day version of um, Dr. King's white moderate, right? Mm. That's what we're dealing with right now. And we have to get over that hump, first of all. Like everybody just has to just accept, oh my God, we have been inculcated into white supremacy. Holy shit, we need to fix this now. Admit it, not get sensitive about it. Robin DiAngelo talks about this in White Mm -hmm. Fragility, right? Mm -hmm. She says, Mm -hmm. you gotta stop being all defensive and shitty about it. Just be like, yup, I'm racist, now let me change. Instead of being like, oh, I'm racist, I'm going to clutch my pearls and go crawl into a cave and die. You know, like, don't do that. That just stops the conversation. You just accept where you are and then you change that behavior, right? And and this idea, this is something that occurred to me the other day and, like, sounds very simple but was mind-blowing to me. And maybe that's just because I've been drinking tequila. But, <laughs> but here, so I grew up idolizing whiteness. Mm-hmm. I grew up thinking white men were beautiful. Mm -hmm. I grew up dating white men. I grew up Mm -hmm. only dating white men. Mm -hmm. I grew up thinking white men were the apex of beauty, white women as well, right? I wanted to be white. I thought whiteness was great. Why the fuck then can't whiteness turn that around and start to see other people, people of color in the same way that I grew up seeing whiteness, right? Like there's no biological barrier to that possibility. I'm like living evidence that a person who is brown can grow up idolizing a person who is white. Why can we not then change the conversation? First of all, get rid of idolization in general, right? But Unless why, it's for me. <laughs> well, you are gorgeous. <laughs> but like, why? Mm. why? Like, that is a thing that happened to me. Like, I still struggle with white men to this day. Like, the way that I idolize and glorify whiteness. Like, I, this is the thing I'm unpacking. As I say these things on Twitter, I'm learning about my own self and my own blind spots. Like, that's my vulnerability and that's what I share. And that's my authentic self. But like, if that's a thing that can happen to me, then why the fuck can't whiteness start to see blackness as beautiful? Right and start to idolize and and glorify and and and, and see blackness as powerful and gorgeous and wonderful. Right, it, clearly that is a thing that can happen. It can. There's no barrier to that. So it's like acknowledge that that we've been like programmed in a certain way, but we don't have to be. And the way to deprogram is to have these conversations and to talk about these things and make them super public and like no holds barred. Like we can't. We don't have fucking time to lose. Yeah. No, that's why, that's why, and I'm always calling people out, and it gets real uncomfortable, mm. as you know, especially with my neighbors. Because <laughs> I try to, I, I try to live like that, and before, I didn't, because I was the same as you, I think, Sonia. Like, I hated my curly hair, like, to the point where now my hair doesn't curl like it used to, because I've straightened it so much, yeah. you know, um, where I felt like... I wasn't attractive Mm -hmm. because, like, I have, I'm not supposed to say this, but whatever, I have a brother and a sister, and all three of us are really good looking, okay? Really good looking. And we didn't even know that, right? Ugh. We didn't even know it. And I feel like that has influenced my life in a pretty intense way. I always felt like I was so ugly. Me too. And, boy, James, I don't want to get you in trouble with the wife, but do you think there's two ugly women sitting at the table with you right now? I do not. Yeah, because we fine. So I'm just saying that that's that's the reality of it is, is like I am an attractive person, and I never knew it because of white supremacy. Yeah, we have to undo in ourselves what white supremacy told us about ourselves, and then white supremacy needs to undo in white people what it teaches white people about us. There's two levels, right? Can I ask you a question? Me? Yeah, James. James. Um, How do you feel or think about this idea of unpacking white supremacy like in yourself or like I don't know you know like can you do you have an, can you speak on that a little bit mm. I mean yeah that's a huge question though that's what do you mean 
in terms so, of like how I benefit because from I, it? What well, you I feel like intellectually, I know you, right? Uh-huh. And we have a personal relationship and our families are close and all of that. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I feel very safe and very comfortable with you in Good. most situations um, when it comes to talking about race. Because I also feel like if I say something and uh, you're not going to be like, nah, nah. Like even if you're thinking it, you're not going to fucking say it. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, see? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, but no, no but, but I, to but, be real about it, I mean, we're, I don't, um, I mean, I think I give, I think that I give you pushback on a lot of stuff all the time. I'm not going to give you pushback on stuff where you're, that you're talking about your experience. That wouldn't make any sense. I don't have any input on your experience or on a black experience or a woman's experience, et cetera. So that's something I don't push back on. I think, I don't think it would speak really highly of our, of our friendship. If like the basis of our friendship was that we literally never disagree. I think we just agree on most things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to. Except on Imagine. I love that song. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you motherfucker. It's like the only. I'm just kidding. I do. I like thought that. if a white guy shits on the Beatles on a black <laughs> podcast, you get like points. <laughs> no, nothing. Um, I'm sorry. I interrupted you while you were asking me the questions. So you were saying. I'm just, I'm just curious, I guess, about it because I think people think they do the work. The white people. And um, we can go, like, I'll just say white people. Yep. That's okay. There is no such thing as not all white people. Remove that from everybody's lexicon. I don't know, because I don't, I don't feel like I have that many white people in my life. And, you know, my mom, my mom is deceased, but, like, I feel like we might, my own mom, you know, where I was like, she white and I love her and stuff, but, like, she doesn't know what's going on, you know? And... There are few people where I do feel like comfortable enough. And then, but there also comes a point where sometimes you think the white person is at a certain place. Yeah. And then something you say yep. pushes them over the edge. Ah, like it has happened to me so many times. I think I'm down to like two white women friends. No, I'm not even having any new white friends. Yeah. I already told that. In 2018, I was like, everyone else grandfathered in. Every single one. I was like, white eventually. James okay. Yep. My girl Hannah, she cool. And Hannah. I think it's weird that they're both named, one's named Hannah, one's named Hannah. They both wear glasses and they're both librarians. Mm-hmm. And they're both cool as shit. And I love them. But I will say like, but they're, they're an example though. There are people that I do feel comfortable with where I feel like I can be myself. Yeah. And I can say, like, what's on my mind. But even as I'm saying this, I'm lying a little bit. Because stuff that I would say to you, Sonia, or, like, some of our other guests that are guest slash friends, <laughs> like Gabrielle Bryant, you know, like, stuff that I would say to her, I, I wouldn't say to you. Uh-huh. You know, like, I would just, that's just, like, between us. Sure. And that's normal, though. And I think that's another thing. And you've said that. You said that once, and that really stuck with me, James, was when you said, you're like, everybody code switches. And not in a gross, all lives matter way, but just that we do. We have different ways of behaving, but the consequences for people of color is so heavy. You know, like, you can be different at your work, but, like, for people of color in work, if we don't do it, like, our livelihood depends upon it. Sure. Our success depends upon our ability to be able to communicate in the dominant culture style or whatever, which I'm really fucking sick of. Yeah. I'm so sick of it. I'm about to go on a rant. Oh, shit. Here it comes. I am so tired of having to, like, adhere to these, like, white cultural norms, okay, that surround... Everything that we do where we have to be behave in a certain way. And I'm not talking about let's just all rip each other's heads up and be crazy, but it's like, okay, it's a small thing and I bring it up a lot. <laughs> like, I'm late a lot to stuff. Like I'm late, you know? But I do feel like in various cultures, I don't I'm pretty sure like almost every culture except the quote unquote white culture has that, right? We say colored people time, right? CP time. Yo, Jews, Jewish standard time. They're late as shit, okay? <laughs> like that's a real thing. I don't know. Are Indians too. 
<laughs> All yeah. I know we is we arrive when we arrive. I was due to be here at eight o'clock, <laughs> and I have a text from you, Rebecca, at seven fifty six, asking if I'm on my way. Because so I, that's all. I'm just I'm just throwing that out there for. And the reason why, why James, because you've been late a lot. <laughs> texture. You've been late a lot, <laughs> and I didn't expect it from you. So you're breaking a stereotypical norm. See? Okay. I can't swim. You've you lost your white swim. person card. Yes, uh, sorry, revoked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who are I you think now? It's funny now that who you can, are you I can't believe you got your white identity. Oh my god, James. Yeah. Who are know. you? Oh shit. I don't know. Right? Because like I've know. always had to identify. Like that's always like after I got over that, like I didn't know that I was brown and I just thought I was bad growing up as a kid. And then I was like, oh shit, I'm brown and there's a bunch of white people. And that became who I am. Like now I know how to, I'm navigating constantly navigating. You are too white spaces as as someone who's not white. So what would you do without that identity? It's kind of a twisted question that I'm asking right. you because here's the thing is like, this is my identity because I'm not the default. You are the default. So you probably never have to think about your whiteness. Right. That's. So you don't identify as white. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, I mean, that, if you want to talk about unpacking whiteness, that was for me, the first realization that came was um, the realization of how many things I don't think about in a day. That was something that keyed me into that, into the the way in which um, whiteness was a default and the way in which it still is and the way in which I hear it all the time from people who are in every conscious way, uh, very liberal or progressive or leftist or whatever. But I hear, I just talked to someone the other day. I can't remember who it was. They qualified, they were talking about two different people and they qualified one of them as being black and one of them as being old. And the hmm. old person was a white person. Huh. Because yeah. white people are yeah. just people. Mm. And they they only get modifiers if they're like young or old or fat or thin or tall or whatever. Um, th- and that's just, that's so deeply ingrained in our language and in our basic cultural psyche. And so, and I... Th- and that's why I call your motherfucking ass white James. I, I, Do you I, think you can start calling white people white people? Could I start calling white people white people? I actually do. Mm. That's actually something that I I consciously do, and it's really funny when you do it. It's really (laughs) funny when you say to people, this is a fun game for white people. If there's any white people in this game, it's really fun if you are um, describing someone to someone and they don't know who you're talking about, use white as the first adjective that you use to describe them. It's always really amusing. Nobody ever says anything, but there's always a little... You can feel it You can it register in it in the face. There's always like a twitch. It's always really interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so I do do that a little bit. But I think like the big thing is like... And it's like, I don't know. I can't speak from any kind of authoritative place. Like Nobody can. Like Rebecca really, and I are very, very close now. I don't think we would have been 10 years ago, five years ago maybe. I don't, I don't think I was there, whatever place mm. there you're talking about. Like it's, a, it's, been an, mm. it's been an arc. It's been like a, you know, I've made, I, I, I've probably made almost every white people mistake there is to make. So like, but it's, to me, the empathy gap is the big thing. So, like, when you talk about, um, Sonia, when you talk about can, can white people learn to like, to love blackness or something? The problem is that I think white people do love blackness. They don't love black people. And so, like, the problem is that everything's tied to objectification. Mm. Men who think they love women love them in an objectified manner. And so it's a very, that I think is the, the struggle is to like, and I don't know how to answer how a person should do that. Some of it is thankfully just something I have in me. Some of it is having grown up in a mixed race family. Some of it is um, just, I keyed into the right piece. I discovered like James Baldwin and it blew my fucking head open. Like, Mm. you know, and it's like, sometimes you just find the right person who can put something in a way that it keys into you in that moment. But it's like, I don't know. I think if you can accept that, if you can come to see that, uh, how does H soul say it? Um, can you name a single structure in your life that was not created by white supremacists for white supremacist purposes? And ultimately you can. And if you can recognize that about your society, and then you can recognize that you are socialized in it and a beneficiary of it every day, then maybe you can begin to do whatever that work is. And, 
if some people don't get to it until they're like 60, then I can see how maybe it's a pretty steep fucking learning curve. So maybe the earlier you get to it, the better. But I don't know. Is that an answer to your question? I think that's an answer. Yeah. Um, well, you hard as shit, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> uh, uh, the thing I would challenge, and this is the thing that I am challenging myself to do, because like I said, I'm in between whiteness and blackness. And what I've decided is that I'm going to use that to benefit blackness. I don't mm. need to, nobody needs to benefit whiteness. I'm done with that. Um, and so I get to actually, so by virtue of the fact that I'm an acceptable minority, which is all sorts of bullshit, but that's what white people think of me as I get to use that privilege to amplify and lift up black women in particular. That's like, I've just picked that. That's the thing I'm doing. That is my, part of my goal. Um, so I'm using my position and reeducating myself in the sphere that I live in um, to understand white supremacy and understand the role of white supremacy in the lives of black Americans very specifically, because honestly, I think that's like black and indigenous. Um, Mm -hmm. those two, those two demographics in this country are what we really need to reckon with. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, first generation Indian immigrant, like we'll get there to me. Like I'm okay with like not doing that first. Right, because uh, we, honestly, we do need to prioritize at this point because things are that bad. It's not as much uh, dyed in the wool yeah, of the there. fabric of the mm. country. Exactly. Right. right. I don't have. But there's no legacy of slavery. Right. Right. Um, and so I get to now use that position because I I am also subject to white supremacy, but I'm also like benefiting from it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have made a conscientious goal to take proactive action to uplift very specifically women of color, black women. What do you do and how do you impart to white people then, okay, now I've done this unpacking and I'm doing this unpacking. Like the un- You can't just like do the unpacking and then be like, I'm done and now I'm going to take action. Sure. Like, you take action while you're unpacking, right? right? So, so how do you impart that to other white people and encourage them? And like what, are, what kind of actions do you take and what kind of actions do you think other white people can take? I mean, I raise two white people. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one thing that I have to do every day. And the older one in particular... Um, asks me about what people look like, which often includes skin color, virtually on a daily basis. So that's a conversation I do get to have every day. And then um, I do this podcast and just try to be present for stuff that's happening in Denver. That's a question that I ask myself constantly all the time. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for answering. Sure. I think that's an acceptable answer at this time because in my mind, I'm like, why James does his part by making sure that my shit goes up on the internet. There you go. Honestly, that I really do feel like that, though. Like, I'm like, okay, like, this is, in my mind, this is reparations. And I've said this before, right? Because I am half white. I have a proximity to whiteness. I have all of the white beauty standards, except that my hair is curly and my skin is, like, light brown, right? Mm-hmm. So those are, like, small things that, like, you can do that are not, you know what I, do, does that, is that, do I sound totally crazy? No, I think that's, I mean, I don't think of, it would feel very condescending for me to describe what I do on this show as reparations. But um, I do think that I and you are like blessed to sit with like the most most amazing people who live in this city. And like, and I think that it's a really, really cool opportunity that we get to be some kind of sounding board for them. Um, Yeah, I definitely feel that way. And I, I, certainly felt that way and feel that way about like the archived episodes we have for Greg. I'm stoked that we, that there's more Greg to put in the world and that it's only there because we've done this. Like, so yeah, I do feel that way about it. Good. Yeah. Cause you know what? White James, yeah. when my ship comes in, baby, you can have a dinghy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you get. Motherfucker. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 We got it. We got to cut this off. So this is the conclusion of a part one with the great Sonia Gupta. And if you want to hear more of this conversation, which I know you do, then you need to subscribe and check out part two. Off Color is a presentation of Tan Tigris Productions, hosted by Rebecca Henderson, produced by me, James Meekum, music also by me. Check us out on Twitter at Off Color Pod, on Facebook at Off Color Podcast. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. <laughs>